Good morning. Welcome back to the Retirement Report. I'm Hank Parrott, your host. All right, we're going to jump right back in again. I want to get as much in here for you as we can this morning. And again, we've got Jeremy Threckeld with uh, Virtue Capital Management, as well as Phil Cosmala with Tabor Cosmala on the phone. And uh, Phil, we were talking just before the break about housing, and in particular, uh, some of the housing numbers that have been coming out. It looks like you know we're really seeing a, a big drop off, uh, in particular when you think of how hot the market was and how that was um, you know houses were selling above list price they were selling within two or three days of hitting the market uh, certainly a, a seller's market all the way around but now that's with the higher interest rates of course when you have mortgage rates more than double in a year's time uh, that's pretty phenomenal and certainly having the uh, the negative effect we would expect it would yeah, I think, I think if we look at our next chart here, the reason housing is so important, and I'm glad you raised this question, the reason housing and shelter in general, that includes housing and apartment, uh, apartment renting, mm -hmm. those two components are major weights in both the CPI index, which we talked about last segment, as well as the PCE, the personal consumption expenditures, uh, which is the Federal Reserve's preferred indicator of inflation. But the CPI calculation is light blue. You. Shelter. And so what that means is the direction of housing prices is a tremendous leading indicator as to the direction of inflation in general, and ultimately whether or not the Fed pushes us fully into, into a recessionary territory by, tight, by over tightening. And so when we look at these data points, Hank, on the next chart, mm -hmm. um, if we look at, you can see that we've had three consecutive months where we had 40 year highs in the shelter component. So that, that's the very bottom, that may be hard to see on TV, mm -hmm. but just so everyone knows, it's a lagging indicator. And I think what's a little bit disturbing to the markets is the Federal Reserve has not acknowledged that this is a lagging indicator. The shelter data takes time to reflect its way into CPI. So Hank, your point in Middle Tennessee, a hot market, uh, we've got a lot of clients down in Texas, especially in Austin and the DFW, the Metroplex, and down in markets in Florida. And we've seen that cooling um, even in the hottest of markets over the past 12 months. And as a result on our next chart, mm -hmm. because it's such a disproportionate waiting shelter, as a team, the team at Virtue Capital Management, we're keeping a very close eye on the shelter component. Um, we think inflation is actually falling much more precipitously mm -hmm. than what's reflected in the data. Um, even at the fall from 9.1% inflation, down to 8.5, down to 8.3 to 8.2, and then ultimately last month down to 7.8. Hank, if you look on the left side there, you're right, housing prices have been falling. We, we look at Zillow prices, the Federal Reserve has more tool, tools at their disposal. The metric that the Fed uses, which is that yellowish color, yeah. that's the number that feeds into what's called owner's equivalent rent. That's the Fed's uh, estimation of shelter costs in the United States. Hank, they take a survey every month. They call folks up, and they've done it since, since the 1960s. They call folks up around the country, and it's pretty statistically uh, it's statistically stratified on how they do that sample. But they'll call Hank up one month and say, Hank, what could you rent your house out for, for fully furnished? And they call Jeremy the next month and ask the same question. That's how they come up with the definition of inflation in CPI and PC is really antiquated, Hank, especially given how, how much data we have at our disposal now with things like Zillow, with things like apartment lists, where you're getting a pulse of national pricing. What we've seen, Hank, is that light blue bar mm -hmm. and the purple bar, those have been falling for five months. As the Fed started raising interest rates, we've actually seen home prices around the country, as well as apartment prices, fall off a cliff. And despite that, the Federal Reserve is telling us that this is the hottest in, uh, housing market for the past four months that yeah. we've seen in the last 40 years. Yeah. So it's disturbing when you have a Federal Reserve with 400 PhDs in economics, a $2.6 billion annual budget for salary, yeah. and oh, by the way, the 18,000 employees, and they're looking at data that we collected since the 1960s in an antiquated way. And so I think that's the uncertainty. That's what's keeping a lid on stock prices in the short term, is the Federal Reserve appears to be driving the car, looking right. through the rearview mirror at 100 miles an hour. Right. Um, when in reality, what do we know, Hank, is that housing prices aren't falling. It's not unique to Middle Tennessee 
we're seeing that, that around the country, especially in the markets that had, uh, had really quick advances over the past two years since COVID. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, we, we think inflation does continue to move down, and that ultimately allows the Fed to take their foot off of the brake on the economy, and we, we should have a good result if that is the case. Yeah, and that's uh, the next slide. You've got a heading there. Powell and Company continue to confuse both stock and bond markets. Uh, this is, I mean, it's always the the fear, right, that the Fed is going to make things worse rather than better. Right. And, and, you know, like the markets hate uncertainty, right. and the problem is we've had Fed governors even the last couple of days here in mid- middle November. Right. We've had Fed officials on the speaking circuit saying. They're worried that the market's getting too complacent on their tightening path. At the same time, you have the New York Fed and San Francisco Fed publishing this research. On the left-hand side, the New York Fed, which is the largest economic research uh, uh, unit within the Federal Reserve, they've been publishing that inflation has been falling for six months. Hmm. On the right-hand side, the San Francisco Fed, the second largest research bureau uh, of the Federal Reserve, is telling us that two thirds of the inflation problem that we have is because is still because of the lingering effects of COVID and supply chain disruptions. Hmm. So you've got the, really the Federal Reserve talking out of both sides of their mouth and confusing market tank, and that's why we've had such a crazy volatile path this year, where we've had three ten percent rallies interspersed with five ten, 10 plus percent corrections. That's not normal. And it really is the Federal Reserve that's been causing all of this consternation all year because of the mixed messaging. Markets hate uncertainty, and they're giving us a heavy dose of uncertainty. And mm-hmm. I, I glossed over one of the pictures earlier, Hank, and there's no need to flip back to it. But when the most powerful man in the world, at least in, from a financial perspective, the Federal Reserve Chair, made the proclamation in uh, late June that we understand better now how little we understand inflation, that was not a vote of confidence that the markets wanted to hear. And it's right. really resulted in a lot of volatility in, in markets. That said, Hank, we're basically right now with the S&P 500, we're exactly where we were in middle June. So we've had four months of a lot of volatility, but ultimately the selling pressure that we saw the first six months of this year um, is clearly abated for the time being as we've seen these inflation numbers start to peak and and, uh, come down. Yeah, in fact, um, I'm going to bring Jeremy in a little bit here. Jeremy, one of the things that we're seeing, and you're probably talking to your clients about it in the same way I know I am, they're very concerned about the effects of inflation, what the Federal Reserve is going to do, mm-hmm. and how that might affect what they need to be doing at this time as far as their portfolios. So what type of advice are you giving your clients? Yeah, Hank, like, like I said earlier, you know, we went defensive earlier on, you know, just like with Phil, we I look at a lot of economic indicators, and one of the things I'm paying attention to is things like manufacturing and consumer credit card debt. And what I'm seeing is that the consumer is tapped out in terms of uh, how much inflation they can handle in spending. So, um, you know, we went defensive earlier because we just don't know what the market's going to do for the next six months. So what I'm telling my clients is, hey, yeah, there's a great 10% rally. Um, 20 or 2008 had multiple 10% rallies. I think it's better to be safe than sorry and hop back in this market. I really want some more positive data over the next two, three months or a quarter before, you know, we really get aggressive uh, and, and jump back in. Good point. And, you know, uh, Phil, this is one of those things we were talking about a little earlier as well, is that when we're, we get this one little data point here with uh, October's inflation number and markets react pretty positively with that. But the, um, the, the other news, and I think right then was when they had the two missiles uh, hit Poland from Russia. And, though that, and then you get the people running around over there saying, well, did they come from Ukraine or did they come from Russia? And well, it wasn't intentional, but the potential for that war to boil over to its neighbors through some type of dumb activity, you know, action on the part of either side, uh, that's going to be another factor with regard to the markets, however short or long, of course, would depend on the severity and, and if we get other countries all of a sudden being sucked into that conflict. Yeah, Hank, I think uh, Jeremy summarized it pretty well. When you think of we've got all this uncertainty surrounding the Fed's reaction function to the inflation data with a couple of more inflation prints before the December 14th Fed meeting, 
And then you throw on the uncertainty with Russia, Ukraine, and the attendant impact that that has on all commodities, Hank. It's not just the energy markets in Europe, it's also the grain markets and the metals markets. Um, so you can see persistent inflationary pressures because of these geopolitical concerns. Mm -hmm. Prolonged war, like you said, Hank, an inadvertent strike in a, a neighboring country, um, that could cause additional uncertainty and an elevation in some of these inflation numbers. In addition to the fear of World War III, like I mentioned earlier with the Bay of Pigs in 1962 or the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1966. So there's a lot of uncertainty regarding what's happening geopolitically. Um, mm -hmm. throw, hey, Hank, you could throw China, Taiwan, right? Some sure. of the messages that the Chinese have been sending yeah. regarding their uh, territorial claim on Taiwan, that would be another powder keg. So I think Jeremy summarized it pretty well. Um, we uh, manufacturing slowing, consumers, the low end consumer, the bottom 20% of income uh, income earners are clearly feeling the wrath of inflationary pressures, and it's starting to creep up the income brackets. The one saving grace is that we were we doled out a lot of money during COVID, mm -hmm. and we watch balances, cash balances, Hank, very closely. It's been a great indicator of recessions, and Americans are flush with cash. The bottom 20% they've burned through all of their COVID relief money, but 80% of the country continues to spend. And we're seeing that manifest itself in great retail sales numbers where we continue to see the spending, just that shift from goods to services. Uh, if you've been on an airplane recently, or if you've gone to a hotel, hotels are jammed. Every airplane, every seat is sold on, on flights. People are not, they're not buying goods and services. They're, they're going back to our restaurants, going back to hotels and airplanes. So we've got some countervailing forces here, Hank, which I think Jeremy summarized it well. The team at Virtue Capital Management, we have an array of technical strategies that we watch. And we need more clarity, Hank, to feel more comfortable yep. because of all these risks. Slowing manufacturing, does the Fed make a policy error and tighten too much? Geopolitical concerns. All of those are headwinds, and I think we need to be very tactical in this environment mm -hmm. because there's so much uncertainty from an economic front, from a monetary policy front, and also from a geopolitical front. Phil, do you also track as far as uh, credit card uh, debt and how people are, you know, so when we're seeing, like, say, consumer spending uh, being uh, still still elevated is part of that being uh, being fed by uh, running up their credit cards as opposed to just you know writing checks out of the bank kind of thing yeah you know I think the, the beauty with the data is we're, what we're seeing is the bottom 20 percent of income earners are running up their credit card balances mm -hmm. but 80 percent of the country is not doing that and okay. so I think that that's constructive from an economic perspective I mm -hmm. you know, feel horrible for the folks in the bottom income, uh, uh, the bottom income quintiles in the country, because the ravages of inflation, food and energy prices are absolutely decimating their balance sheets right. and putting a lot of stress on those families. Um, but 80% of the country continues to spend. We we did have retail sales out, Hank, mm -hmm. and the retail sales number was absolutely booming even after adjusting for inflation. Excellent. Americans continue to spend, so mm -hmm. we're not we're not seeing any signs, and we're not seeing credit card delinquencies. I think. Jeremy's point is valid that credit card balances are going up. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that we watched though, the canary in the coal mine in 2007 even, even before the great financial crisis, was we started to see delinquencies, credit card delinquencies, right. auto, uh, auto asset back securities, those delinquencies started to skyrocket. And there's no evidence of that just yet. Hey. Excellent, but that's good news. Said, monetary policy usually takes six to nine months to mm -hmm. feel it, to, for us to feel the impact in the economy. And we just felt the first 75 basis points of tightening. The last three 75 basis point increments by the Federal Reserve haven't been felt in the economy yet, nor have they been felt by consumers facing higher credit card payments because interest rates have gone up. So mm -hmm. there, you know, I think there's a reason for pause there, Hank, that we could see some of that damage starting yep. to reflect itself in the data over the next couple of months. That's an excellent point. And I think we're going to take a quick break, Phil. And when we come back, I'd like to have you talk a little more about that, in particular, the, uh, the these lagging indicators and the fact that the Fed, uh, more and more, it seems they should be taking a pause and letting us see, you know, basically what the effects of their uh, current actions have already had, wait until that kind of washes through a little bit rather than keep their foot on the gas pedal the way they are. But we'll, we'll first to break, and then we'll jump right back into that. Uh, join us here. We'll be right back on the Retirement Report. Key to covering breaking news is...